So uh, if you have your Bibles, you can open them to Galatians chapter 3. That's kind of where we're going to start today. Galatians chapter 3, uh, really verse, just verse 28. We um, continuing our series, You Asked For It. And one of the challenges, of course, of a series like this is that sometimes people ask questions that you'd rather not answer. And today is one of those questions I already had someone say to me, well, you know, good luck with your execution. <laughs> so, uh, today's topic is uh, biblical gender roles. Women, can women de be deacons and can women be elders? And so that's kind of the question. Whoever raised this question, thank you very much for doing that. <laughs> Does the Bible affirm gender confusion when it says there is neither male nor female? Does the Bible say women must be silent? Are some of these statements just based in the culture of that day? And should our enlightened culture overrule their archaic cultural beliefs? Do gender roles still matter? These are some of the questions that I hope to answer today. Let's start with a word of prayer and then we'll get into it. Lord, we just come and we do thank you for the great privilege we have of being here. We thank you for the privilege of worshiping you. We thank you for the privilege of seeing those who went through the waters of baptism publicly declaring their allegiance to you. And I pray, Lord, that as we um, now worship you through the study of your word, that you will speak into our hearts and into our lives. And Lord, I pray that we'll be able to differentiate between what is culturally relevant today and what your word says, I pray. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. In Christ there is neither male nor female. Galatians chapter 3 verse 28, you have the verse, uh, verse 27 says, For all uh, of you uh, who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free man, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And so what does that mean? There is neither male nor female. One in Christ does not mean the same. And I think that's one of the big challenges that we face today is people want to say, and they'll use this particular verse to say that um, women should be able to hold the role of an elder in the church, should be able to be the pastor of the church. Um, they should be able to do whatever a man does in the church or whatever a man does in the home. Now, this is not a message meant to be down on women. So ladies, don't get your backs up. Okay, we, we will come full circle, don't worry. Okay, the men will get a slap on the side of the head too. In fact, I had a line in here so harsh that my wife told me I had to remove it. She said, you can't say that. She said, that sounds too much like Mark Driscoll. So, so I might or might not say it, we'll see. But uh, I did remove it from my notes. So ladies, don't, don't get all up, uptight, Okay. But we need to understand something here. Paul's statement um, did not end gender realities. Men did not stop being men and women did not stop being women just because of what Paul said here. No more than Jews stopped being Jews and Gentiles stopped being Gentiles because of what Paul said here. We still have Jewish people today. Nationalities are still a reality. I am Dutch. Through and through. Ask my wife. She'll tell you. I'm Dutch. There's no question about it. There are certain things that are in my character because of my nationality. And I'm Frisian on top of that, which makes it even worse. Because we're the most hard-headed people that exist on the Dutch country. Nationality did not change, even though Paul said there's neither Jew nor Greek. Slave nor free. You know, Paul's statement did not end slavery. In fact, there is a lot of what Paul teaches later on, and he says, you know what, if you are a slave, this is how you ought to behave as a Christian slave. He doesn't say, oh, you're no longer a slave anymore. No, you're still a slave, and as a Christian, you need to live this way, and if you're an owner, 
and you're a free man and you own slaves, he doesn't say, let the slaves go. Instead, he says, this is how you ought to live as a Christian. And so how does that fit with this statement? That there is neither free man nor slave, neither male nor female, neither Greek nor Jew. This is not about gender, it's about salvation. It's about salvation. Paul was saying that, there is, that, uh, that salvation is for everyone and everyone is equal in that salvation. Man, woman, Jew, or Gentile, free or slave. All. The gospel was shared and was given to all and all could freely respond to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And there is no differentiation whether you are a man or a woman, whether you are someone who is wealthy or someone who is poor, whether you are someone who is from Jewish descent or from Dutch descent. By the grace and the mercy of God, the gospel of Jesus Christ goes out to all and any person from every nationality and every background has the freedom and the privilege of responding to the gospel. And when they do, in Christ, we are all saved by the same grace, by the same mercy, and we have all received the same salvation. That's what he's talking about. You know, there are many religions that that's not true. Hinduism. A woman cannot get saved in Hinduism. Now, if you talk to modern Hindus today, they'll say they can. But if you read their works, the reality is you can't. A woman cannot get saved in Hinduism. She must first become a man. Now, how does that make you feel, ladies? You must first become a man. And we're not talking here about changing your gender through surgery or anything like that. But you're going to have to be reincarnated into a male body because a male body is considered higher than a female body and closer to that step of salvation. In Mormonism, women's salvation is completely dependent on their husband. If you've read any of the, the, the reality of the Mormon theology, the Mormon theology basically is that at the day of resurrection, when Jesus Christ and Joseph Smith come back for you, if you're a Mormon, the husband gets raised out of the grave. And on his way up to meet Jesus Christ and Joseph Smith, on his way up, if he was pleased, if he was pleased with his wife during the life here on earth, he will turn around and call her from the grave. But if he's not, tough luck, ladies. But in Christ, in Christ, the salvation of a man, the salvation of a woman is completely and utterly dependent on the mercy and the grace of God and God alone. And it is extended to all people of every race, of every nationality, of every economic spectrum of society. The gospel is given to all. That's what this verse is talking about. So this verse has nothing to do with the gender roles within the church. And we can't use it to say, oh, see, because men and women are, there's no, neither male nor female, so women can hold the same position a man can hold within the church. The gender roles are still a reality that we face every day. And so that brings me to the next point. And again, ladies... <laughs> Just take it for, you know, what it is, right? Are women allowed to speak when, uh, when men are in the room? That's my second point. Are women allowed to speak when men are in the room? Some believe that women are never to speak in church. And they'll go to 1 Corinthians 14, verse 34. The women are to keep silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak but are to uh, subject themselves, just as the law also says. If they desire to learn anything, let them ask their own husband at home, for it is improper for a woman to speak in church. So, it settles it, right? That's pretty straightforward. Women are to be quiet. Simple as that. Ladies, when you walk through the door, you can't talk. Some have said... 
You know, and, 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 and there are churches that will take that, exactly like that. The women are never allowed to speak. Uh, when I was in Bible college, I had a one of my professors, and she actually grew up at Brian Baptist Church. Her name was Taransky, and, uh, and she was a phenomenal teacher. And there's many people here who still know, know of her and have had her teach them while they were here and in part of the church here. So how, how do we deal with this issue of women are to be silent in the church? What do we deal with that? Well, some have suggested that the issue that was really happening in, in the Corinthian church now is that women were speaking up and they were asking questions in the middle of the service. Now, in some traditions still to this day, men sit on one side of the church and women sit on the other side of the church. And in that culture, um, it would have been very much like that. The reality is that men would have been on one side and women would have been on the other side. If you go to a Jewish synagogue, um, the reality is that the, the main hall is for the men and the women have a side hall with a bit of a screened in area and they can listen in if they want to, but they're kind of segregated off to themselves. Uh, I've been to a number of synagogues where, where that's just the reality. And, and so uh, th they're separate from the men. And so one belief is, is that basically what was happening in, in Corinth was the fact that the women were sitting on this side and the men were sitting on this side and the preacher, whoever was speaking, was speaking from the word of God and was saying something. And the wife that was sitting over here hollered over to her husband who was over here. Is that right? Uh, can you explain that to me? Can you just imagine if while I'm talking, you guys started hollering at the people over there to give you answers? It would become chaos very quickly. All you need is one or two people to do that. And so it's believed that Paul was saying, that has to stop. That can't be allowed. And that that was the issue that they were facing. Others believe that the issue was actually the issue of tongues. And that what he was dealing with was the fact that tongues was primarily a women's issue and driven by women in the church. And they were um, speaking out in tongues at inappropriate times and in ways that was disrupting the church. And that that's why he said, they need to be silent. They need to stop speaking. Of course, we do have 1 Timothy chapter uh, 2, verse 11. A woman must uh, quietly receive instruction with entire submissiveness. And that's Paul talking again and teaching Timothy about how to you know, deal with the church. And we're going to deal with the rest of that passage in a few moments. But that still raises the question, is quietly the same as never talk? Right? Quietly. I mean, I, I know that in situations like ours, where you're sitting side by side, you may whisper over to the person next to you and say, I don't agree with what you just said there. Or, you know what, I'm not sure that that's quite you know, the way it should be understood. And we may do that, but it's quiet. It's not disruptive. It's not, you know, and, I, and so the question is, is it the same thing as never talking? And some again will argue yes, while others will say no, that's not what he's talking about at all. He is simply saying that we need to be respectful. And that women need to be respectful in the church and conduct themselves in a respectful manner. See, if 1 Corinthians 14 is women are to be silent and never talk in the church, then we have a contradiction when we come to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, which is just, you know, three chapters earlier, where Paul actually tells the church, he says in 1 Corinthians 11 verse 5, but every woman uh, has her head covered while praying or prophesying, sorry, every woman who uh, has her head uncovered while praying or prophesying disgraces her head, for she is one and the same as a woman whose head is shaved. For if a woman does not cover her head, let her also have her hair cut off. But if it is, uh, but if it is disgraceful for a woman to have her hair cut off, or her head shaved, let her cover her head. And so it's interesting that in this passage, Paul is telling the women, two chapters before he says women are to be silent, right? And he says it twice there in 1 Corinthians 14, they're to be silent. Two chapters or three chapters before that, 
He tells women how they're to dress when they're going to be praying or prophesying in a church service with men present. And the whole reason for the head covering in that passage was so that she would show that she was not taking authority over her own husband. And that's why she had to have her head covered. Okay, and so that, was, that whole passage is dealing with, with authority and, and all of that. And so she needed to have her head covered when she was going to be publicly praying or prophesying. Now, historically, as Baptists, we have always viewed New Testament prophesying as preaching. Now, I know that we've kind of come away from that a little bit. And I think some have come away from that because they want to be able to somehow allow a woman to still say something without her preaching. And, and I'm not going to suggest that we're going to have women preaching. Don't, don't get me wrong. But I'm not convinced that the Bible says that a woman could never get up and speak and address the congregation. Because she's doing this in a mixed crowd. And Paul is saying, this is how she's to dress when she does it. And so how can you have on the one hand, this is how you're supposed to dress when you do publicly speak. And on the other hand, you're not allowed to speak publicly. Well, then, then why have the instructions on how to get dressed? Does it make sense? Unless the silent had more to do with a problem that was in the church there and less to do with the fact that just all women were to be quiet and not talk ever within the church and never have an opinion and never say anything. As if that would ever happen, right? Really. I mean, honestly. Like, like we are a people of God. And it's not just the men. Now, that brings us to the question of women deacons. What does the Bible have to say about that? Again, if you have your Bibles, you can turn to 1 Timothy. So actually, no, not quite 1 Timothy first. Romans chapter 6, uh, 16. Romans 16. Let's start there. In Romans 16, and I'm going to have to speed her up a little bit. Uh, Romans 16, verse 1. We have the Apostle Paul. He says, I commend to you our sister Phoebe, who is a servant of the church, which is in Caesarea. Now, depending on your translation, if you have the NIV translation, it will translate the word servant deacon. If you have the revised standard translation, it will, re, re, uh, it will translate or, or, or transliterate the word into deaconess. Okay? And so what has happened is, is people have said, see, we have Phoebe was a deacon. And so, clearly we can have women deacons. Because the early church had women deacons. Because Phoebe was a deacon. And, and, and the word there is clearly, depending on your translation, it's either deacon or servant. So many have used Phoebe uh, as the example of a woman deacon and thus pushed for not only women deacons, but they've said, see, women can hold positions of authority in the church. And so they've even moved it beyond that and said, um, women can be elders as well. But the word deacon is the word servant. So the word deacon here in, in Romans chapter 16, verse 1, is the word for servant. The word is used 29 times in the New Testament. And depending on your translation, using the New American Standard translation, it is translated three times as deacon. And, or, or deacons, seven times as minister, ten times as servant, and nine times as servants. So then the question that we have to ask ourselves is, how is that word used here in Romans chapter 16, verse 1? And is the translation of that word as deacon or deaconess correct? Or should it really just be servant? You see, on the other hand, we have what we refer to as the office of a deacon. There um, really are only two clear texts on the, the issue of the office of a deacon. The first one is Acts chapter 6, verse 3. Therefore, brethren, select from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Spirit and of wisdom, whom we may put in charge of this task. And so this is when the church institutes the office of a deacon. 
there was a problem. A certain group of women were not being cared for by the church properly. They were being overlooked. And so in response to that, they came and they complained to the, uh, the elders and the, the apostles. And the apostles then said, okay, we're going to not take care of this ourselves. We're going to have some men who are going to take care of this. And we're going to appoint, uh, we're going to have you uh, select for yourself seven men that we then can appoint as deacons over the church. Have you ever wondered why seven men? Have you ever considered that this was countercultural to have seven men doing this? Women took care of women. Many cultures to this day, women take care of women. Men don't mess with that. Men don't go visit women. Men don't go take care of women. There are many cultures that even if a woman comes into a hospital, a, a male doctor cannot even assist her. It has to be a female doctor. And in their culture at that time, it was very much that way that women took care of women and men took care of men. And here you have the church, the early church, establishing the office of deacons to care for a problem that was women who were being neglected. It would have made more sense for them to have appointed seven women to take care of the women in the church. It really would have. Nevertheless, God had them appoint seven men to wait on tables. You know, so I believe this is very significant. It was countercultural. They could very easily have said, just select for yourself seven people who are godly. But they specifically said seven men. And it was a women's issue, and it would have made more sense for them to have appointed women, but they didn't. The other passage, of course, that is interesting is 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12. Deacons must be the husband of only one wife. Deacons are to be the husbands of one wife. Some have tried to explain this away. Eugene Peterson in his translation or his, um, his uh, paraphrase of the Bible, he has changed it to be the, the spouse of one spouse. Um, but it's interesting because the very language that he uses for spouse of one spouse when it deals with the deacons, in the very same chapter, he says the husband of one wife when he's dealing with the elders, and you can't have it both ways. It is either the spouse of one spouse for deacons, thus also the spouse of one spouse for elders, or it's the husband of one wife for elders and the husband of one wife for deacons. I believe those are the clear texts that deal with the issue of whether women can be deacons, whether women can be elders. Acts, of course, makes it very clear they appointed seven men, even though logically you would think they would have appointed women, but they appointed men because God had directed them to appoint men as leaders of the church. Why are men still the leaders at home and at the church? Why is that why is that important? Well, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 11, where we touched on that, a woman must quietly receive instruction with entire submissiveness, but I do not allow a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man, but to remain quiet. For it was Adam who was first created, and then Eve. And it was not Adam who was deceived, but the woman being deceived fell into transgression. Many want to say this was just a culture this was just a cultural reality for Paul's day. They want to say that Paul was just speaking as someone of his time. And they'll try to explain this away. But that neglects the understanding, the, the underlying reality that this is not Paul's word, but God's word. And the moment we start playing that game where we say, well, that was just Paul speaking as a man of his time. We are neglecting the reality that that was and is the Word of God. And I know that there are times when there are cultural things, and we need to always be careful and looking through and examining, but this principle transcends culture. And it transcends culture because this goes right back to the very beginning of time before culture even existed. 
You say, well, how that's possible? What is culture? Culture is the characteristics and knowledge of a particular group of people encompassing language, religion, cuisine, social habits, music, and arts. The Center for Advanced uh, Research on Language Acquisition goes a step further, defining culture as uh, shared patterns of behavior and interaction, cognitive construction and understanding that, uh, are, that are learned by so, uh, socializing. Thus, it can be seen as the growth of a group identified, fostered by social patterns unique to the group. So our church has a culture. Okay, because we are a group of people and there are certain things that we believe, there are certain things that we do, we have a culture. And, and, and the reality is in our world today, um, your children that are teenagers have a different culture than the parents have and the children that are going to come up after them are going to have a different culture again. But let's, let, let's figure this, it is based on the creation order and so Paul is not basing this in his culture of his day, he is saying this goes right back to the very beginning of time when God made Adam and Eve there was no such thing as culture because there was only two people there was no group, they had not yet established religion, they had not yet developed art, there was the bit of the, you know, here's a fruit, do you want to take it but, but that's about it some of you caught that there was no culture this is not culturally based it's based in the creation order. God made Adam first. Genesis chapter 2 verse 18, God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I'll make him a helper, a companion. And so Eve was made as Adam's helper and companion. And so that's the first reason or basis why God has determined that it is to be by man. Men are to be the head of their home. And I'm not talking here about being a brute I'm not talking here about being the boss. I'm not talking here about being the domineering one. The one who leads, who directs, who guides compassionately, caring, lovingly, considering his wife first, foremost, above himself, but nevertheless leads. And that same is true for men in the church. It is unacceptable. And Paul even deals with that. If, if, if a pastor or if an elder in the church starts to act like he is the Lord of the church, deal with him. Because we are not to behave that way. But we are to lead. Compassionately and gently. But lead we must. Because of the creation order. And the second is because of the fall. It's also based on the fall. Eve was deceived and ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Adam was not deceived. Now, have you thought about that? But that passage is so clear. Adam was not deceived. Adam, with his eyes wide open, chose, instead of being the leader he ought to have been, to follow his wife into sin. That's why God holds him responsible. That's why the sin is passed down from the father to the next generation. So how does this impact us here today? Well, our constitution here at Lansing says that the leadership of Lansing is set up that men are elders and deacons. We have lots of strong women here. And they're very much involved and able to be involved in ministry on many levels within the church. And we welcome that. And we thank the Lord for that. I mean, frankly, this church would not be half of what it is today or even less if it wasn't for the women and their active involvement in ministry here on a continual basis. And we thank God for you and for your ministry. But some see the biblical teaching about men being leaders in the home and at church as a put down on women. But I want to encourage you, that's not the case at all. It's the complete opposite of that. This is a call on men to step up. We know that men, and this is where I had to change some lines. We know that men tend to be happy to let their women live, uh, sorry, let their women uh, in their lives just take over. 
we're happy to step back. I'm already out of time, but I was going to say men, men have a tendency to be lazy. But my wife said that was too harsh. But let's be honest, guys. There are times that we have that problem. Our wife will do it. <laughs> Man, let her do it. Yet it's our responsibility. And we just let her do it. And men, we cannot do that. This is God's call on men to step up. Ladies, God's call on men to step up is for your benefit. It's so that you don't get saddled with the responsibility that he is supposed to take. For the jobs that he is supposed to do. For the things that are his responsibility. You already have lots of things that you're doing. In fact, most women do way more than most men ever do. It's true. And yet we want to give you our responsibility on top of that. And God says, no. No. Men, step up. Be the leader in your home. Be the leader in the church. And don't walk away from that. Let's pray. Lord, we come. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the reminder that um, this call upon men to step up is not a put down on women. You love our sisters as much as you love us and maybe even more at times because they're so much more open to you than we often are. And so I just pray, Lord, that we as men would cherish the women in this church, we would cherish the women in our homes, and we would do that by being the leaders that you've called us to be, loving, compassionate, but leaders nonetheless. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.